Assistant Administration Miniconf. And we have three talks left in the Miniconf. And up now is Andrew Gall giving us a reintroduction to S3FS. Over to you, Andrew. Hi. Uh, yeah, I, I'm going to be reintroducing S3FS. I am one of the maintainers of, of this file system. Um, so just a, a brief overview, uh, S3FS is a, a Fuse file system that allows POSIX applications, which means uh, Linux or Mac OS or FreeBSD, whatever, uh, to mount S3 object storage as if it's a um, uh, local file system. Uh, so Fuse runs in user space, not in kernel space, which is why it's portable across all, this implement, all the different operating systems. Uh, it was created in 2007, uh, around the time uh, S3 was introduced. Uh, had a couple of wilderness years after that, uh, but has had pretty state, steady maintainership for the last seven or eight years now. Um, it's compatible with um, Amazon S3 is the most famous uh, S3, but there are many implementations, um, tens or a hundred, if, depending on you want to count. Uh, so it's, it's really compatible with everything, including S3, like partial S3 implementations. Uh, it has many uh, packages available. Most Linux distributions, uh, you can just install it. Um, App to get installed or whatever. Uh, it does exist on Mac OS as well. Um, and it, it works well for several use cases, uh, but not, not all of them, which is what we're going to explore in this talk. Uh, S3FS is a leaky abstraction, and it has some data consistency and performance pitfalls. Uh, S3FS usage is really simple. Uh, you, um, you configure your, um, your S3 credentials, uh, and then you just run S3FS uh, bucket and a mount point. And then you can interact with it as if it's a local file system. So in this example, let's say we write the file foo, and then we can read the file. We can stat the file and see that it has the correct metadata. Um, and the, the good part about S3FS is that you can interact with files um, through other S3 applications. And so here we're using the AWS CLI, and we can see that foo exists. Uh, it's four bytes as we expect, and we can round trip the data. So S3FS works well in some situations. Um, so first of all, when, when POSIX compatibility is required, um, if you, you don't need POSIX compatibility, please don't use S3FS, uh, use a native S3 application. Um, it does support most of the operations that you would expect, uh, but it can't support uh, hard links or atomic renames of files or directories due to uh, the underlying S3 um, limitations. So S3 is, is really good in kind of mixed environments when you need some POSIX and you have some other S3, um, either data producers or consumers. Uh, uses the, the normal S3 object format. Uh, it stores kind of the extra POSIX bits in S3 user metadata, like UIDs and permissions. Um, S3 works best, S3FS works best for, um, for sequential read and write uh, operations, usually kind of bulky data on larger files. And I would define larger files as something that would range from five megabytes to um, five gigabytes or, or more. Um, S3FS does work uh, for files up to five terabytes, although it has some uh, limitations when writing those that we'll talk about uh, on a subsequent slide. Um, similarly, like, S3FS doesn't work well for directories that have um, lots and lots of uh, um, single directories with lots of files. So I would say like tens of thousands of files is, is manageable, but when you get into the millions or sometimes billions, it, S3FS just can't, um, it basically can't issue a reader. Uh, so that's, um, it, it's not gonna work for you for performance reasons. And, and generally, we would think about S3FS working well when you have high bandwidth and low latency to the S3 server. So um, for example, my uh, bucket is in the United States and I'm in Tokyo, and that's a uh, little, little slow for me, uh, just from the round trips from all the HTTP requests. So um, the downside of S3FS is that POSIX compatibility introduces overhead that you wouldn't have with a native application. And you can kind of think about um, uh, the analogy of, of uh, hammering a square peg into a round hole. Like it, it'll work with sufficient force and time, but it's, it's not uh, natural. So uh, one of the reasons for that is that read dir is a pretty expensive operation. Um, so in addition to read dir issuing a, a list objects request in S3, it has to issue a head request for each object to, to translate that and get the stat file to return that to read dir. So this is, is ruinously expensive uh, for that example with millions of files. Uh, another pitfall is that there's uh, random writes will amplify, which means that if you write one byte, um, it, S3FS actually has to write five megabytes to satisfy the, um, the API requirements of the S3 multi-part upload um, uh, request. So if, if you're doing lots of small modifications like a database, you will not be happy. Um, and another kind of interesting area is that 
upload it, uh, updating metadata, like if you're doing a, a change mod dash X, um, change mod plus X on, a, on an object, uh, it actually copies all the data on the S3 server. I mean, S3FS doesn't see that, but the S3 server is working very hard to, to move all that stuff around. Um, so I, we, we do recommend you use native applications when available. Uh, so AWS CLI is much faster than LS or Fine, for example. Uh, our clone it has native S3 support, which is better than doing an rsync onto an S3FS mount point. Uh, a lot of applications do have native S3 support, like um, uh, Percona XB Stream. Uh, it, it's better to do that, uh, do that natively instead of um, doing XB Stream to a, a file locally and then copying it. Uh, so S3FS does have some other downsides. Uh, it has really primitive multi-client coordination. So if you're familiar with NFS version two, uh, it, it lacked a lot of the um, strong semantics that we, we enjoy in, in more modern versions. And so it's, S3FS is kind of similar to that. So it has what's called closed to open data consistency. Uh, and this means that when a, when a S3FS uh, client is writing to a file, uh, and S3FS won't, uh, won't write that to the S3 uh, server and it's not exposed to the other clients until the file, the file descriptor is closed or uh, you do a, an F-sync. Uh, and so this is, this is bad because at, at multiple clients may cache um, stale data and you have incons inconsistencies there. Um, and this, this gets a little bit worse uh, for even metadata um, because reader is so expensive, S3FS will uh, cache it for a pretty generous uh, 15 minutes to avoid um, uh, capturing that again. And so as you might expect, I, I notify doesn't work for S3FS as well. Uh, there's a, a wrinkle to S3 implementations themselves. Um, so traditional file systems give you what's called strong consistency. And that means if you were to take a, a file uh, and write uh, one version of the data to it, and then overwrite that file with a second version of the data, that when you read that file, you will always get the second version of the data. And this is the, what traditional file systems guarantee. Uh, Amazon recently started guaranteeing that uh, last month, which was, was really great for users. Uh, but traditionally, S3 implementations uh, only guarantee eventual consistency. And so this means if you echo foo to a file and echo bar to a file, when you catch file, you, you may get um, foo or bar for some implementation defined period of time. This is because most S3 implementations are distributed systems, and to have the availability that they're, they're going for, they give up consistency. Um, I did measure this in the real world a long time ago. Um, I, I was able to see that this happened one out of 1,000 times in the worst case. So this is one of these things that happens sometimes, but not often enough for you to, to notice it regularly. And it'll just seem like strange semantics. And furthermore, caching can hide this behavior, which um, maybe is good for, for you as a user, but it makes it even harder to validate whether your application works when there's eventual consistency. So uh, you, you want to make sure that your workload can tolerate these semantics since they're not the normal POSIX semantics. Uh, S3FS performance can be good. Uh, out of box, it's actually tuned for uh, lower memory systems uh, and desktops, laptops, uh, Raspberry Pis, and, and low memory containers. But you can easily double performance by changing some of those defaults. Um, one of them is um, for reader, one of the slowest operations, is multi-rec max. Uh, it's the number of parallel head requests that reader can issue at the same time. I believe that defaults to 20. And you, you should be able to get uh, linear performance by raising that. Um, dash O use cache is important. So most, most S3FS users have kind of a streaming performance they're going for, or they're doing one pass over, over data, um, either reader, reading or writing. Uh, for those use cases that are using the same uh, data over and over again, you, you want to turn on caching. And the reason this isn't set on by default is it can use a lot of space in slash temp, which is, um, can be precious to some users. Uh, the next three flags control how S3FS is able to write data to um, S3. So uh, parallel count is the number of parallel put requests. By default, this is five. Uh, some of the clients use 10 or more. Uh, this is one of the easier ways to double performance. Um, it's, it's kind of a little bit in conflict with multi-part uh, size. So you, you kind of, you, when you're writing lots of data, you want to have as um, many parallel put requests going at the same time to use the entire uh, pipe. Um, you, you don't want to set the multi-part request, multi request too, too big or too small. Um, to, um, you want the, the connections to be long-lived, and you, you kind of want usually uh, one connection. Um, you, you, you want to, to kind of pick uh, the, the lowest number that gives you uh, all the parallel counts uh, used, or highest number that all the parallel counts used. Uh, max dirty data is kind of an interesting recent addition. Um, this is um, 
is the amount of temporary data that S3FS will hold on to before it will flush to S3. So S3 is a immutable object store. And so um, the way S3FS is able to have uh, mutable files on top of that is it buffers things locally and it'll periodically flush that and it'll do a, um, a multi-part upload, uh, which can be some combination of new data and uh, copied data from the server. So uh, if, if you were creating very, very big files, like the five terabyte example from earlier, you want to set this as high as possible to avoid the number of uh, rewrites that uh, will be done by the server. So there's been a lot of changes in recent years. Uh, if you go to Stack Overflow from 2013 or 2014, you'll see a lot of users upset about, especially bugs in the system. And, and so this has been my, my focus, is fixing a lot of the concurrency, data corruption, and Postgres compatibility uh, issues that were in there. Um, so if, if you've ex experienced like poor, um, poor correctness before, please, please try again. Uh, we're, we're, we're much better place than we were six years ago. Uh, we've, we've backed that up with much more robust testing to prevent regressions. Uh, we're, we're really in a much better place now. Uh, we've had a lot of users contribute um, packages to all the major distributions. That was a, a kind of focus of a couple years ago. Um, more recently, we're getting into performance, um, especially uh, there's this kind of like everyday performance we've made read, write, and read dir faster. Uh, but we are starting to look at um, much larger files now. This is, is important to um, some users, especially machine learning community, and but but other other people as well. Um, so the, a, a key one that was kind of foundational for some future ones was. Um, partial updates to, uh, to objects via server-side copies. Uh, before uh, 2019, if you wanted to append a single byte to a, a, a file, it would actually have to copy the whole file locally and then sync that whole thing back to uh, S3. Uh, now it'll actually just issue a server-side copy for the first n bytes and append that one byte to the new object. Uh, this enabled the subsequent uh, opti optimization for writing files larger than local storage. Uh, so now we can create things larger than temporary storage, and we flush every uh, five gigabytes, I believe. Uh, there's a couple odds and ends of, of pitfalls. Um, we, we have a lot of reports from users where update DB is, um, uh, is, is indexing their S3 container, which is not what they expected, especially when they have multiple S3FS clients on many machines. Uh, this is easy to work around by adding prune paths to updatedb.conf. Um, S3FS does use temporary storage and slash temp, and especially for users creating lots and lots of big files, uh, it can uh, consume a lot of space. You, you can kind of influence this with, with the Adasho ensure disk free uh, flag, um, but it, it's just kind of a limitation of this uh, mutable uh, file system on top of an immutable object store. Uh, there's, there have been a lot of people that have had uh, permission problems. Um, old versions of S3FS did not have the correct defaults uh, when the um, uh, metadata headers weren't present. We do have the correct defaults today, although there's still uh, teething issues with, with people that have either created things with different UIDs and different systems, and so you can override that with dash O umask. Uh, a natural comparison people make is uh, S3FS against NFS. Um, these are actually very different systems. They're, they're both good for different reasons. Uh, NFS is a better choice that when you need um, multi-client coordinations or you're making lots of small modifications to files or you're, you're listing very large directories. Um, NFS just has a, a better protocol to deal with this kind of thing. So you'll, you'll see that uh, the, the NFS has strong semantics via leases instead of uh, S3FS has just timeouts that it uses. Um, and the write granularity can be as small as a single byte for NFS before versus S3FS requires writing five megabytes. Uh, Reader is much better for NFS because of a single RPC instead of uh, O of N RPCs. Uh, but in S3, S3FS's favor, um, the actual S3 cost, at least on Amazon, can be 15 times cheaper. Uh, this is really, S3FS is really a good solution for bulk data. And of course, if you're trying to interoperate with um, other S3 applications, it's uh, better to, to do that through S3FS. Uh, there are uh, alternatives. Um, there's a couple of S3 alternatives. Goofies as um, a very good, um, well-tuned, performant S3 file system. Uh, gives up some POSIX compatibility to, to achieve that, which um, you know works for some people, and I'm, I'm glad uh, that this exists. Uh, S3QL is a little bit more interesting. Um, it's more of a local file system that uses SQLite uh, locally to store all metadata, and it has its own object format, so it's not interoperable with other um, S3 applications. I uh, gave a talk about this at Ohio Linux Fest. If you are considering these alternatives, please, please look into that. Um, and it's just worth saying that there are other clouds and other protocols. Um, you may want to use those uh, fuse file systems uh, if you're on those clouds. Uh, just to wrap up, uh, S3FS provides uh, a lot of POSIX compatibility uh, using a S3 object store. 
Uh, this, this compatibility imposes overhead. Please use S3 applications when, when it's appropriate. Uh, there's been uh, a couple of important features and fixes in recent years. So if you were unhappy before, please, please try again. Um, and if you're still unhappy, please try tuning the, the performance via the flags that I suggested earlier. And, and finally, consider the alternatives when your use case demands it. Uh, so I think we're going to be taking questions uh, in the chat room after the fact. Yes, that's correct. Um, there are already some questions waiting for you in the venueless um, chat room uh, alongside the video. Um, thank you very much for the talk. Um, it's really good to see that this is an option when your use case actually needs it. Um, we now have a 10-minute break, and then we're back with a talk from Matthew. Okay, thank you.